Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Marzullo, and I'm the Dean of the University of Maryland's College of Information Studies. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our roundtable discussion, your online data and algorithmic bias, how it affects you every day. This is a topic that impacts all of us and is one of the many areas we think about in our college. I'm looking forward to a spirited discussion. Before we get started, I want to let you all know that this event is being recorded and we will post it on the iSchool's YouTube page in the following weeks. Your thoughts are an important part of the discussion. Please feel free to submit questions for the uh, Q&A portion of the discussion using that Q&A feature on your screen. If during the discussion you'd like more immediate clarification from the panelists, then you can use the chat feature to elicit a quicker response. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Professor Jason Farman. Dr. Farman is a director of the Design Cultures and Creativity Program here at the University of Maryland. He's also a professor in the Department of American Studies, a faculty member with the Human Computer Interaction Lab here at the University of Maryland, and a faculty associate with Harvard University's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. He's an award-winning author and has written about technology, history, and media studies over the last decade. His most recent book, Delayed Response, The Art of Waiting from the Ancient to the Instant World, to the Instant World is a celebration of waiting throughout history and of its importance for connection, understanding, intimacy, and human communication. I've got to say, this is a topic that has wonderful salience these days. Uh, Jason, uh, let me hand this off to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dean Marzillo. It's such a pleasure to have all of you joining us this evening for a topic that really couldn't be more relevant uh, at this time. And we are bringing together experts on this field. So whether you've approached algorithmic bias uh, as a researcher, as somebody who does this uh, as a part of your everyday work, or if you're someone who's new to this topic, hopefully today's discussion will be uh, insightful for you and to expand your own uh, knowledge <clears throat> on the subject. I want to turn it over to the panelists so they can each uh, briefly introduce themselves and uh, we will then jump into questions from, from there. And uh, if we could begin uh, with Marjorie Blumenthal, please. Hi, I am a longtime science and technology policy person. Most of my career has involved tracking the emerging and evolving trends in computing communications and their societal impacts. Pleasure to be here. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I am Senior Fellow of Governance in Governance Studies and the Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution, which is a think tank headquartered in Washington, DC. My work actually touches upon regulatory and legislative issues as it relates to technology. I'm writing a book right now on the US digital divide that will be out from Brookings Press in 2021. And in my spare time, I work on issues related to artificial intelligence, particularly algorithmic bias. So I'm excited to be here here tonight to delve into this issue of AI and the consequences. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Dan Jen Goldbeck. Hi, uh, I'm Jen Goldbeck. I'm a professor in the iSchool. I'm a computer scientist by training. Mm -hmm. I study artificial intelligence and social media. I build a lot of the algorithms that do creepy things. And then I also study the good things and frankly, mostly the bad things that come out of that. Great, fantastic. So you're all coming to the topic from different fields of study, uh, different areas of expertise, different ways that algorithmic bias uh, intersects with the work that you do. So I was hoping you could just talk about what the term algorithmic bias means within your fields or field, field of uh, study. Um, and we could go around uh, in, in whichever order you uh, like. Um, could uh, maybe Jen start us off? Sure. Um, I, I mean, you're right to ask because I think we all have slightly different conceptualizations of this and, and I can sort of see it writ large, but in terms of like where I tend to come to this, um, there's some people who don't believe artificial intelligence can be biased. And, and we've seen this this year, members of Congress, you know, criticizing other people for calling this out saying, she thinks math is biased. Like what's wrong with her? Because artificial intelligence has what I like to call this veneer of objectivity, right? You put some data in and the math makes a decision and it gives you an answer. So it can't be racist or sexist or biased, but of course it can, right? Because it either reflects back societal biases that are in that data that we train it on and we'll get a lot more into that, or it's just missing data 
about a lot of people. And so it can get a very specific idea of what some people are like. It just has kind of a vague notion of those other groups, which means there's a lot more error for those groups it doesn't know about. And so in both cases, you can get the artificial intelligence making unfair decisions about people based on the kind of characteristics that we always talk about. Um, and correcting for that technologically is very difficult. And it's, you know, I think, one of the biggest problems that we're facing in the field right now. So those are the, the kind of questions that I like to look at here. Great. Yeah, Nicole, can you talk to that question? Yeah, no, and actually, Jason, before I start, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say this. In my introduction, I failed to say that I'm also affiliated with the University of Maryland in the iSchool as well as in the PLA program. Um, I do teach there too. Okay, got that. Great, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I want to pick up on what Jen says. I'm a sociologist, so I am not a computer scientist. I am not a mathematician. I'm a doctor in sciences. And my whole uh, reality of my educational methodology is really framed around the implications of various structural um, differences that in many respects may lend itself to bias. So I define bias generally when similarly situated objects, places, and people receive different treatment. And in the case of what we're going to talk about in terms of algorithmic bias, disparate impact. So the best way I can explain it to the people that are listening today is to sort of give you a layperson's example. I love black boots. And any chance that I get to buy black boots, I will buy them. I buy them so much that the internet knows that I buy them. And I get all of these recommendations and ads and the positioning of black boots in my email. And it shows up on my social media platforms. And as a result of that, the internet really is clear that I'm a person who likes black boots. Later in my online activity, they may find out that I have a daughter and she likes black Barbie. So now they've associated black boots with black Barbies to maybe make the assumption that I am a woman, perhaps a woman of color who likes black boots, but may have a daughter and may also be a woman who is African-American or of some other darker skin tone because of the fact that the internet never asked me my identity. Then over time, they might find out that I buy black boots so much that I'm always checking my bank account to make sure I have enough money to buy the black boots. So now the internet has compiled through inferential data what they think about me. A woman who is obviously a parent who likes black boots and clearly shops too much because she's always checking her bank account. For most of us, that's an innocuous way to look at AI systems, where it actually scrapes what our online activity is to make assumptions or predictions around our behavior. Where it becomes bias is if the internet takes my profile and then begins to make assumptions based on the fact that I am a woman of color who is historically categorized in groups that are underbanked or unbanked, who also, as a result of my propensities to shop may not have good credit, where then I am them served ads that are predatory or high interest rate offerings around credit cards. That then begins the process of differential treatment. I'm a similarly situated person who buys the same stuff, but I have a different historical profile and potentially disparate impact. And so going on what Jen said, these models may not start out to be any way, you know, trying to be predatory towards the outcome of the subject. But they, in many respects, end up that way because AI is not deployed outside of the context in which we live and operate. And that's why I think this conversation is very important because we often don't understand that all of the data that we feed the internet ultimately finds itself with a digital footprint. And based on who you are, that training data may result in you being denied a loan, being denied credit, getting a longer sentence in terms of bail, and having different types of opportunities come to you, which as a sociologist, you already know, we find that to be unfair and discriminatory in the way that we look at it. You, you, I, I tell my mathematician friends, and I'll end here, science is objective, but the people who program it are not. Right. Because the values, norms, and assumptions about the world factor into those models. And as a result, going back to my example, it makes certain assumptions that infer who I may be, which I think then leads to, Jason, algorithmic bias. Because once you begin that train, it's very hard to recurate or change the narrative in a flurry of data variables that are about you. Great, fantastic. Thank you so much for those examples. Uh, Marjorie, in your field, uh, what does algorithmic uh, bias, uh, how, how is that term defined? How is it used in the fields that you work in? So, so first, let me just 
take a, a page from Nicole and, and add my own postscript. I should have said I'm a senior policy researcher at RAND uh, <laughs> at, at the moment and uh, mea culpa on that. But I think Jen and Nicole have very nicely bookended um, from a technologist point of view, from a social scientist point of view, how do people think about algorithmic bias? So what I want to do is, is pop up a bit and say, when we think about the concern today, it's not just a creature of modern artificial intelligence. If we think back to the middle of the last century, before the computer revolution at all, as we knew it, a guy made a lot of money on a book called How to Lie with Statistics. And he knew there was a demand for that book. And the name of the book then became a, a kind of running joke at, you know, later, later in the last century. But the point is, people have been looking to do this kind of thing, manipulate data for various purposes for a long time. The, the second touch point from the middle of the last century was that, you know, there was this expression, garbage in, garbage out. And that has been a situation where, again, as computing has evolved, the situation has gotten better in some respect, but the potential is still there. So I think it's very important not to say it's only a new phenomenon, it's only new technology. We're looking at something that has evolved for a long time, has, has been with us for a long time, something we might get into a little bit later, builds on the examples, the very personal examples that Nicole gave. Because when it comes to advertising and marketing, the, the individual profiling, the understanding of the nature of market and so on has existed for a long time. I'm sure we'll also talk about other kinds of, of application domains, but from where I sit without the, the obvious um, disciplinary anchors, I sort of look at all of these, these phenomena interacting uh, and I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, great, thank you. And you've all given some really fantastic examples that help uh, concretize what algorithmic bias is. And for the audience, as you are listening to the panelists speak, do feel free to use the Q&A if you've got questions. We'll bring a lot of those into the very final 15 minutes of our uh, discussion tonight where we'll bring up some of those questions that you ask uh, through that channel. Uh, but what is the scale uh, of the issue at this moment in time? You've, you've touched on a range of spheres and, and moments in everyday life when algorithmic bias might touch us, affect us. Um, so can you talk about how much data there is? What's the scale of the issue? Um, is it isolated in particular realms? What are we dealing with? What What is the scale? Um, Nicole, maybe I could turn to you for that to start us off. Well, I mean, I think that the scale is so much broader and, and I think Marjorie sort of hit at it. This is not new in terms of our use of data to micro target, you know, groups or to micro target us for advertising preferences based on the fact that the internet in and of itself as a policy framework is free. There's a reciprocity that exists between what we put into it and what we get out. Um, and we don't pay for that, right? And so this economy of our individual data is what fuels, I think, this machine learning algorithmic economy in respects that the variables are just so much more massive, right? I, I tell people when I think of machine learning, I think of scuba diving and just being at the bottom of the ocean. It's almost like a snake. You know, you come out and then you're slithering all the sand particles until you're completely covered. We're not snakes, of course, but that's the stuff that you see at the bottom of the ocean. And the deeper you go, the more opaque the ocean is. And that's how the internet is operating today. Now, some would argue that that is sort of the, the creepiness of the internet because it's very hard to discern what variables go into models and what the variables come out of because the algorithm in and of itself starts in a lab, but it adapts to our particular circumstances. And so to me, it is very vast and it has implications. You think of what has actually happened over the last eight months where we have all been home um, because of social distancing and the amount of data that has been collected about us. The internet knows what movies we've watched at 10 o'clock before we um, go to bed. It's why it, it knows what hot cocoa we buy uh, based on our spending patterns. When it puts it all together, 
it has the opportunity to weaponize against certain populations, which is my concern, and how that weaponization looks has the ability to create uh, the same type of levers that, that create sustained discrimination. And that's for me is something that certain groups have worked too hard to be in a state where the technology further marginalizes them. We also see that, and you know, just to push it a little further, it's not just your spending or the advertising, it's the disinformation that feeds off of the type of patterns and trends that we have. So I would say, you know, as my mother would do, and she calls me and she says, baby, I, I just looked up tents on, you know, this particular commerce site, and now it's showing up in my social media and it's on my email, and, and, and I think I got a text about it. Well, guess what? That's the new economy in which we live. And that economy, uh, Jason, is so vast that it's even hard to discern where it starts and where it stops. And that's why the work that I do is so consuming and often exhausting because I cannot often get and no offense to my engineering and mathematic friends here, but I often cannot get like a determinist understanding of how we actually control what could become the potential harms and the potential weaponization of these technologies. Does it start at the beginning of the box or does it start at the end of the box? Or is it all the stuff in the between that garbage in garbage out that you mentioned? And for, for a person like me, it makes it much more of a vast problem that we really need to figure out the best way to solve it. And potentially with policy prescriptions that at least real in in our ability to make sure it does not you know become a wild wild west with regards to people's personal information yeah great and and i think the you know the scale of it for us as researchers is hard to know but for the everyday citizen as well it's a whole another level of opaque uh, when it comes to actually pinning down what is the scale of what we're talking about and what is what are the larger uh, implications of that uh, jen i was hoping you could also kind of build on this as well with the scale of of the problem here for algorithmic bias. Yeah, so I've got an hour on the data and I've got another couple hours okay, on yeah. the implications. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to switch that down. Um, I'll say quickly on the data side, it's so much worse than you think it is. So, you know, you've probably had that experience or you have a friend where like you said something in front of your phone and then you never looked it up, but you get an ad for it the next day. It's because there's apps that passively turn on the microphone and listen in. So say you rip the microphone out of your phone and make it not a phone anymore they can still, there's still technology that can use the accelerometer, the thing that knows like where it's tilted and pick up the vibrations of your speech and convert that into text. So even if you have the microphone turned off, it can listen in on what you're saying. Uh, Facebook has technology. So say, Jason, we're at an event. None of us are friends on Facebook. You take a picture of Nicole and she's like, that's a great picture. She posted it on her Facebook page. You take a picture of me, I do the same thing. None of us know each other. Facebook is going to suggest Nicole and I become friends because it analyzes the pattern of dust and lens scratches on the picture that came from your phone and knows that we were in the same place at the same time with our photo taken by the same person. I, I literally have an hour of these examples. Like the right. data collection goes so much deeper than, like Nicole was saying, what you bought or what you post online. And then the problems that come out on the other end are also vast. Nicole, I think, did a good job talking about these. And I'll just add the say two of my pet personal worries. One is that a lot of this data is being integrated and Nicole touched on some of that, but you think about like the ring doorbell, right? There's that video, which is being shared with police, which a lot of people don't know. And that's being integrated with facial recognition databases that are crappy and super racist and biased. And that's being integrated with other data and then being used by authorities to make decisions. So it's super problematic at all these stages, but people think they're doing something sciencey, and there's just so much error and bias in there. Mm -hmm. And then it's deployed in these places that are really impactful. So that's sort of like a, people have decided to do this and it's a bad idea thing. Right. The other end of this builds on these examples that Nicole was giving. So I've only been married for a few years. Um, I don't have any kids. That has been an explicit choice of mine since I was very little. I never wanted to have kids very intentionally. And when I was like 30, I was not married and I was constantly getting ads for fertility clinics that would freeze my eggs because they're just like, she's 30 and she's unmarried. She doesn't have any kids. Well, she's going to want to, like, we'd better help her with this. And if you're a woman who doesn't want to have kids, there is a tremendous societal backlash against you, right? That you're not fulfilling like what you're supposed to be doing as a woman. 
and you know including with your doctors right it has been a, a battle of my life <laughs> to to just be like no really like i don't want to do this and so then to have ads telling me this is how you're supposed to be right you should want to have kids you should want to freeze your eggs this is what it means to be a woman it's a problem that you're 30 and you don't have kids like that has an impact just like if nicole is starting to see ads for credit kind of predatory credit cards with these really high interest rates even though she's doing fine she's been classified into a group if you see that constantly that's sort of this force this vague force telling you this is who you are this is how you should be this is how we think of you even if you're not that way and there's you know i am not the sociological expert here but there's really good sociology that shows there's damaging effects that these sorts of algorithms profiling you this way can have and that's nobody making the decision that's bad that's sort of just like a a kind of fuzzy outcome of this that has real impacts and it's it's a place where like, look, we got to fix the bad human decisions first, but this is going to be a place where I think there's there's also a ton of impact and we need to pay a lot of attention. Great, thanks. And Marjorie, one of the questions I wanted to bring your way is thinking about the, the term bias in general. Uh, it tends to bring with it so many negative connotations. I think we kind of jump in talking about algorithmic bias with these examples that... Um, uh, have a very detrimental effect on people's everyday lives. Um, but are there times when bias um, is appropriate rather than harmful? Are there other ways that we might want to be thinking about this term as we begin this discussion as well? Are there, um, you know, do we want to nuance the term bias and algorithmic bias a bit at all? So there have been people who have looked broadly at bias and, and done taxonomies of bias and, and so on. And yes, I think what you're getting at is that it is a, a more complex concept. So some people have talked about the notion of a moral bias. And the example that can be given there is if you're dealing with automated weapons, maybe you want to build in some kind of bias against killing civilians. Um, there are uh, lots of, of algorithms that are used, for example, in developing automated vehicles, which have to perceive the world and they have to uh, plan their routes and they have to execute their routes and so on. Well, it turns out that there are differences in the rules of the road in different areas. And right now, people are not thinking about the universal automated driving system because, and I didn't know this before I started looking at AVs, if you are in Pittsburgh, there's a Pittsburgh left. You know, people give you the courtesy when the light changes of taking a left if that's what you wanted to do before the, the traffic prohibits having that. So there are ways that you can build in a bias to a system that can be constructive and, and positive. So bias isn't intrinsically bad. I, I did wanna just circle back briefly to the, the previous topic on, on scale to note that part of what both Jen and Nicole were talking about is the growing ability to bring together a larger variety of, of data. And I think what we're seeing in, in systems today is the ability to collect data from so many more sources and bring it together. So the example that, that Jen gave of the linking of um, Facebook photos based on the quality of the image, the scratches from the lens, there are other ways to do it that use the metadata of the, the image because there would have been some kind of metadata associated with the photographs that, that you had allegedly taken and, and other people had, had posted. So I think people may not be as aware of all of the different kinds of data, the layers of data that, that accumulate. Um, and yet again, there are many positive examples. If you look at um, how systems are being used for medical diagnoses, getting a lot of data in, you know, you're looking for a needle in the haystack, it seems counterintuitive, but sometimes having a bigger haystack helps you in finding that needle. Mm -hmm. So I think for all of these issues, it's important to see that sometimes there isn't on the one hand and on the other hand, um, when, when you try to find reality. 
Yeah. Jason, can I jump in there too? Yes, um, just to kind of talk about the spice. And I think Marjorie actually placed it really well, particularly in the context of how science looks at it in terms of, you know, the inputs that we see and where this differentiation happens. And I do agree with her. I think that there is always going to be some level of bias in these models because guess what? The internet is based on this differentiation. That's why social media platforms do know everything about you because it allows itself to be this optimized marketing platform to get you directly to the places and the services services that you want to see. But what in my research, what I've been trying to tackle as a sociologist is the differences between the bias that uh, creates differential treatment. Um, and the scientists know what I'm talking about in terms of sometimes that differential treatment will lead to this outcome versus this. And that could be corrected in some way. You know, there's a course correction versus what we call the policy side disparate impact. And when you begin to see the disparate impact where groups are disproportionately impacted differently. So you take a great example of the Apple card um, issue where it had come up, where it was revealed that potentially the wives of the husband were getting different levels of credit or approval. What was interesting about that is the two applied at the same time. And as a result, you saw some kind of differentiation uh, that potentially could have, you know, created disparate impact if it the algorithm was set to sort of be launched in a long term scenario. Some financial experts say that uh, having an authorized user is not the, net, the best variable to determine credit determination because of the fact that authorized users often get rejected or they don't get as much credit. But you look at another example, uh, a healthcare algorithm that used a variable of the amount of money that people invested into healthcare uh, generally that would determine whether or not they would get into a program. In the case of this healthcare algorithm, it was using that variable and assessing it against Black patients who pay less into healthcare. And as a result of that variable, not the race, being a determinant of that difference, what essentially happened is those Black patients were kicked out of that program and they potentially needed that program the most because it was tending to people with chronic issues. That, to me, left unchecked is disparate impact which is denial of opportunities for people who most need it or have been denied historically the ability to partake in those functions. And so I think we have to be careful when we look at bias generally to determine those instances where it's an innocuous in terms of whatever the search query may be or the action and those that actually deny opportunities to certain groups. And that's where I think we not only need algorithms to be responsible and ethical, but we also need them to be lawful. So they're not creating, as we've seen in recent years, you know, HUD eligible um, applicants not seeing housing because the algorithm doesn't think that they could afford that level of housing, that level, you know, that level of rent. Those are the areas as a sociologist which are concerning because, again, it goes back to how do you blend the science with the historical context in which these models actually live and reside and make determinations in what are already flawed systems. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to bring that up because I think Marjorie's point was right on point where I tell people, I love my black shoes. I want to be uh, in quote unquote discriminated against when you send me my black shoes, but I don't want to feel that that also lends itself to higher interest credit card offerings like Latanya Sweeney's work says, because of what you think about my spending. Right. So, so part of what Nicole is saying, again, taking it up a level is you want to see where is there actually harm. And again, I think we have this tension with so many things evolving at the same time. There are, are cases, and, and Nicole gave some, some good examples, where harm has been demonstrated. There are other situations where we go into this and we, we may just assume there will be harm and maybe there won't be. Or, Maybe someone will figure out pretty early on that there's a risk and they tune the system. Mm -hmm. So we have to avoid the harm, but, but not choke off innovation. And that's, I think, the balancing act that we're in. Yeah, great, great. Um, Jen, a question for you. At the University of Maryland here, we have a first year book, uh, which, which is Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Math Destruction, Math Destruction, M-A-T-H. Uh, which um, looks at many of the issues that we've been uh, bringing up so far. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about her work um, and as it specifically addresses moments where algorithmic bias might be damaging. And I guess even a broader 
picture question that I have on this discussion, is there such thing as a non-bias algorithm in a sense then? Because we're dealing with um, human beings and, and, and these various input systems that we're doing, are, are we bringing bias to all of the systems in some capacity? Uh, is, there, is there such a thing as a, as a non-biased algorithm? Is it, is it a bit redundant? Yeah, no, it's both great questions that fit nicely together. Um, yeah, you know, so when Kathy Neal's book came out, um, I initially didn't want to read it because it's marketed as a manifesto, right? And I don't do manifestos. Like, I don't want to hear someone ranting about their opinion. Uh, but she's a very interesting character. So she has a PhD in math, worked at a hedge fund. Uh, and then there was the, uh, you know, all of the uh, Wall Street protests. And she's like, I like what they're saying, but they don't understand finance at all. And so she kind of quit her hedge fund job and then went to work on these sort of social justice issues. And so as a math PhD, she's incredibly targeted with what she's saying in that book. And I think really Nicole has, has nailed exactly the issue. Like she's not saying algorithms are bad, artificial intelligence is bad. She's saying there are places where we're implementing these, humans are using them in a bad way, and they're having disparate impact on populations that are already marginalized. And in those particular cases where they're opaque, they're hard to challenge, they're not being used in a right way, and they're affecting these groups, like this is the box that she cares about. And she's saying that this is a thing that we need to do something about. So it's a very focused argument. Um, and I, you know, I ended up interviewing her for an event for NPR and was really won, won over by how careful she is and, and really laser focused on that particular problem, um, which I think gets it out of the space of someone ranting and, and really like makes a nice clean argument. Um, you know, that said, how, you know, what about these one, these algorithms that aren't in that box, you know, are they okay or not? Um, I think they're, I'm going to go out and say, yes, there are algorithms that are not biased. Um, and Marjorie had sort of alluded to the healthcare space when, you know, whenever I talk about this, we always end up in a really dark place at the end because it's all really scary. And so sometimes people will give me the chance to say, is there anything good going on here? Uh, my go-to example with that right now, um, I mean, yes, there's plenty of good stuff going on here. My go-to example is um, there's a study that just came out in the last year looking at um, patients who had been to a memory clinic. So I think this was in the UK. Um, so they have the NHS, they've got all these standardized records. And these are patients who come into this clinic and are maybe having some just like, I forgot where I put my keys. I want to make sure there's not something more serious going on. And they would do brain scans on these patients and then follow up with them for years and years afterwards. And some of them had no real memory issues, just kind of standard aging little stuff. And some of them would go on to develop Alzheimer's. Um, you can tell when someone has Alzheimer's by doing a brain scan, because basically brain cells start dying, brain cells produce glucose, you can do a brain scan that basically sees little black dots where there's no glucose being produced, and then you know there's brain cells dying and you have an Alzheimer's patient. Um, so people took those brain scans from when people had no symptoms, right? They're just coming in with really basic memory loss. And they had, these people developed Alzheimer's, these people didn't and were able to look at those consecutive brain scans. And what they were able to do is build an algorithm that's, I mean, like over 95% accurate, incredibly accurate, that analyzes those brain scans and can correctly diagnose patients who will develop Alzheimer's six years before a human radiologist can detect that. Um, so you don't have any symptoms at that point. You maybe have very mild memory issues, but you know that you're on a path to develop Alzheimer's um, which may help with treatments that you get and may also just help you figure out what you're going to do with your life. That doesn't have the kind of biases that we're talking about here because it's not data based on human social decision making. Almost all of these examples we're talking about is where the data that goes in is people who have been making decisions or it's reflecting society where that has put us in positions that make groups look different. Um, and, and we may get to some examples of that. And there it's much harder to end up with algorithms that don't have that bias built in. It, it's very hard to remove societal bias from the data that goes into the mm -hmm. algorithms or from the way people act that influences how they get categorized. Um, and just really briefly at the end here, you know, one thing that I was thinking as Nicole and Marjorie were making the really good points you know, before you asked this question is that another part of this problem is that for a lot of us who build this technology, we don't intend it to go out there and be a thing that 
makes any decisions. It, we build it as, we actually have a term for the field called decision support systems. They're supposed to support people making decisions. They're not supposed to make the decisions themselves. So they're kind of here, like, let me give you some advice. This is the pattern that's been done before, but we kind of expect that someone's going to look through that and be like, does this make any sense? Is this biased or whatever? And people just go, oh, it's truth because it's math. And then they let the math make the decision and they take that, that step that we totally planned on out of there. Um, very few of these algorithms are accurate enough to be deployed on their own kind of period, let alone with the biases that are in there. And because people misinterpret them and what they're supposed to be, they use them in ways that end up being unfair, where if they were incorporated into a larger, fairer decision-making process, they could be used much less problematically. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, training people to interpret algorithmic output, you know, that's a big train up that you have to do in a lot of places and they don't want to do it. Great, great. Thank you for that. Um, and Nicole, I wanted to jump back a bit to some of the um, comments you were making and link them with the ways that Marjorie started us off by uh, historically situating us uh, among alg algorithmic bias. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about and, con and continue the conversation about how algorithmic bias is extending the legacies of white supremacy in the US uh, and around the world. Um, how in any way is what we're facing right now with algorithmic bias um, unique and com maybe compares with racist structures uh, that we've faced in the past? Yeah, now that's an interesting question. And it's one that um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop and think about it for a moment from the standpoint of how I wanna answer it. Um, first and foremost, I'm gonna answer it. I'm gonna start my answer this way. Um, I do believe that all algorithms are biased. And let me start by saying that I believe that because um, not because of the intention of the developer with who wants to operate in some level of malfeasance, but developers tend to create models that reflect their life experiences, their values and assumptions about the world. And when you have a very unbalanced workforce that does not represent the diversity of the actors or the subjects that are going to be impacted by these models, you have bias, right? So that is what causes, for example, um, search queries where a person may put in uh, uh, African Americans and get results returned that are primates because the meta tagging of photo images, there was an, um, a misstep or oversight that this could potentially happen. Or another real case example where a person could put in happy teenagers and the algorithm can deliver white teenagers smiling and black teenagers with mug shots. These are real things that actually happen. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that you don't have people who represent the lived experiences of the subjects in which these algorithms rhythms and models will be deployed. It's like AI systems like facial recognition technology that in all intents and purposes, facial recognition is really not that bad. Sometimes facial analysis allows us to detect uh, problems with uh, health through the face in terms of the lymph nodes or the way that our faces are structured in terms of its propensity towards disease. But it's bad when the technical accuracy of the facial recognition technology cannot distinguish between dark and light hues, mismatching African-American women from men, uh, not being able to identify African-American women who change their hair much like I do every week. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that you don't start Start with what I think Jen actually said so well, you don't start with the question of how do we start with fairness first, mm -hmm. as opposed to developing models that we hope will come out to be fair when you don't have the lived experiences of the people that you're affecting. There's a really interesting story, for example, of um, Amazon that was trying to hire more engineers and put together an employment algorithm that was actually using training data of the histor historical records of who were engineers, which were men, and trying to find women. And the algorithm essentially kicked out any resume that had a women's college or a name of Mary Jane or any other recognizable female name. That is problematic when left unchecked in terms of thinking about what could potentially go wrong that we actually don't live in that experience because we think that you know the algorithm in and of itself will go back. I, I call it permissionless forgiveness. When these things happen, all the examples that I shared, usually the developer says, oh man, I didn't realize that that was gonna happen, I'm sorry. 
that's the first part of it. And I think that is an extension of the same type of historical circumstances that we have dealt with with white supremacy. It is a moment in which the foundational structure of the world in which we live is guided by certain values and principles and assumptions about the world. And in this case, they have colonized or oppressed people of color and placed them as the product versus the producer. So that's the first thing. I think also the other interesting thing about algorithms that I'm coming to learn more about is this whole idea that in many respects, we can't blame the algorithm for extending the systemic inequalities that we have. Because essentially, and I call it the algorithmic playground. When I was a little kid, I used to love to play in the playground. They had the monkey bars, the slides, the swings, the sandbox, you name it. That was the sandbox of the playground at recess in school. Algorithms now operate in this way. If you are a white supremacist, you are on the monkey bars <laughs> because the likes, affinities, associations, interests that you actually check, like on social media platforms reflects who you are. Mm -hmm. If you're on the slide, you're a Black Lives Matter activist because your likes and affinities and things that you do place you in that box. If you're somebody who likes nature, you're there. The bottom line is this playground has already been defined before the model is deployed. And unfortunately, and this is the last thing I'll say, the model never brings us together in ways that we used to when we're on the playground where you can go from the swing to the monkey bars to the sandbox yeah. because these models are designed to actually maximize the inputs and the outputs. And that's where, when we look at things like white supremacy, when we look at areas in which we now have revealed our ugly conscious, like James Baldwin would say, our ugly past in our beautiful futures, we actually begin to see that how these models are organized are very much how we are already organized. So they don't start discrimination. They don't actually create it. They actually extended or a reflection of it, which in my opinion can be addressed if we start with what Jen said. Start with where is the fairness that I want this algorithm to have and work backwards versus suggesting that the math in and of itself would be discreet and objective enough to get us to that fairness outcome. So I'll stop there because that's why I love being yeah. around mathematicians and scientists because I always just bring up something different. But I think that's where you have to have different people at the table that's like right. you're doing now, Jason, to actually talk about this. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. That's so great. I, I really appreciate the ways that you're bringing in the context, the histories, and then this uh, contemporary moment um, to help us make sense of all of that. Uh, the last question I'm going to pose to uh, the three of you, and then I'll turn it over to some of the questions from the Q&A, is um, what can we do uh, in, in light of all of this and the scale of it, the opacity of it? Um, it feels a bit overwhelming, I think, uh, to approach the challenge of algorithmic bias, especially around the context of fairness in the context uh, that Nicole just described uh, that brings in these histories and then shifts them in a way that maximizes profits, keeping us separated. Um, what are some steps that um, either industries or individuals can take to begin addressing these issues that we're talking about? Um, Marjorie, could I start with you? Yes. So I think we are at an interesting moment in time because we have been going through several years of coming to terms with a lot of the phenomena that, that Nicole just ran through. And that's a good thing. We did the recruiting example that, that she gave, um, and I think Jen sent a, a reference on, is, is an example because it was detected. And there are other examples that have been famous, they have been detected. So this is a very propitious moment. If I can just run through things that I'm seeing. Right now, data science is a popular field. Uh, Maryland is hosting this. Universities across the country, around the world have introduced new data science programs. And all of them, I would guess, without having studied them, are thinking about an ethical component to what data science is all about as a field, whether it's in understanding the data or understanding the algorithms or understanding the human computer interaction dimensions or anything else. If, if you look at the professional fields, 
a number of them have upped their game on ethics. So the IEEE, for example, has, has an international initiative on ethics in AI. And other fields are doing that as well. So at least there's some sense that, that people are thinking about the issues uh, at a disciplinary level. But a number of the major players, some of whose tools could be associated with the problems that Nicole and, and Jen have, have ticked off, are also developing tools to help understand what is in an algorithm, what is fair. So Microsoft, Google, IBM, they all have tools that are available so people can at least do some basic testing of, of their algorithms. Um, I, I think these are examples of constructive steps that are being taken, recognizing that everybody might not agree on what fairness is, um, as long as there is a, a principle of, of fairness, you can at least have the conversation. And that is an important thing to do. So I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, great. Uh, Nicole, what about you? Do you wanna pick up here? Yeah, no, I think that uh, what Marjorie said is actually true. I think that there are what I call them tools in the toolkit, like auditing, like impact statements, um, like being able to control for certain variables that I think are really important in this. I would add to that toolkit, and it's a model that I'm working on at Brookings, and we actually had Kathy O'Neill come and speak. She's amazing, right? But part of it is, what is the, um, I call it the algorithmic energy star rating. Um, and that is, you know, where do we start in terms of understanding how companies are engaged in a variety of testing? What are some of the self-regulatory best practices? There are some companies that actually deploy algorithms in secondary, tertiary context. They actually pull it from market to recorrect it. They bring it into disciplinary teams. I've been working in my research to figure out what are companies and developers of algorithms at the academic level doing to actually improve upon the performance. Because at the end of the day, it all relates to performance. Mm -hmm. um, if the algorithm is discriminatory and predatory, it's not really performing the way that you, you think it's going to, you want it to perform. Then I think in the middle are these policy prescri prescriptions. So what we find in technology oftentimes is that many of the developers are not aware of some of the civil rights laws when it comes to employment algorithms. So they don't understand that you have to build the algorithm to some level of compliance without totally bustling innovation. Um, I had a young uh, startup founder, Frida Poli, on a panel recently who does employment algorithms. And one of the things she said is she's a neuroscientist, a computer scientist, an engineer. She said every person who works on her team is trained in EEOC laws. And as a result, they're able to see what can they actually build to. A couple years ago when Facebook did their um, uh, model on advertising for housing, they allowed advertisers to check people off. Under law, you can't do that. So I think that there's a bucket of self of uh, policy prescriptions as part of this Energy Star rating that we probably need to explore. What does it look like to disclose to people that this credit decision is being made by an algorithm versus a reputable uh, credit assessment? You know, somebody I think on the question talked about risk assessments. To me, those kinds of things are really important to get to where we want to go. And then finally, something that I think is missing, which is also part of my model, where is civil society in this? To what extent can individuals sort of say, you know what, that's not me, or yeah, you're pretty close, <laughs> but can you send me some other stuff? Where can I actually correct the algorithm to get off of my monkey bars and get into the sandbox? And so I think for me going forward, I came up with this Energy Star rating because I, when I went to go buy a dishwasher last year, that big yellow sticker was on there. And it occurred to me that most people don't even know what we're talking about when we talk about algorithmic transparency. And even policymakers who wanna legislate around algorithmic explainability don't know what they're talking about. And so if we can come up with something that's not necessarily an enforcement tool well, you didn't get the check the box, so you're going to get a, a, a fine. More so like a better housekeeping seal. Which of these algorithms do we know are going to perform in a way that is non-discriminatory, non-predatory, allows for correctable action, and at the same time is very transparent and explainable to the everyday person who is building it? And it's also enlightening to the developer who is now realizing that they could break out of their own bucket of experiences to ensure that the performance of the algorithm is maximized for good or for or more responsible and ethical. So that's what I would add to Marjorie. Like I've been trying to take all the post-it notes <laughs> and basically at Brookings put it all together 
because I think these are really ruling our, our everyday lives and we need some sort of check-in to make sure we're doing the right thing. Great, great, thank you. Yeah, Jen. I'll be really quick so we can fit in some questions. Um, I'm less optimistic than Nicole, so I love all of her ideas, but um, so, as an ex so there's definitely companies big and small who care very much about being fair. Then we look at Facebook uh, who had an internal study that showed, for example, I think like 68% of people who joined white supremacist groups on Facebook did so because Facebook recommended that they do that. And then they were like, huh, we're not gonna do anything about that. Just keep it going, it's fine. Because there is a ton of money to be made on doing these things, right? And, and what we've seen, especially in the social media place is pushing people towards more extreme positions on the left and the right uh, gets more engagement and that makes them more money. And they absolutely don't care past that about doing anything that's fair. Um, and we've seen this in other places. Amazon has had some of these problems. A lot of startups, I mean, Nicole, I am heartened to hear that you were working with someone in a startup who cares because a lot of them are these like white dudes with these like cowboy energies who just don't care at all and are doing what they want to do. Um, so I think we actually see real change here um, through the legal system. I want to be able to sue you if your app told me I couldn't get a job. And you have to prove to me that your app isn't biased. I think if we, if we have a legal framework that allows for individuals to challenge these algorithmic outputs when they have impacts on their lives, you can't hide behind, well, the algorithm said so, or it was only one thing, like prove to me that your algorithm works. Hire some consulting firm that's gonna take a ton of undergraduates and train them as consultants in algorithmic auditing, algorithmic fairness, correction, all of these things that build the industry that we need to sit on top of what we have now. And so if you're Microsoft, who I think is working hard on this, you don't have to bring those people in because you've got that internal capability. Uh, but if I'm going to sue Facebook, I'm going to bring a class action against Facebook and they need to prove that their algorithms are fair. It's going to build that industry. It's going to build that expertise. Um, and, and I think we will need that where it's going to cost people a lot of money. And that's going to force the fairness on the ones who see so much profit now and continuing to be unfair. So I, I hope we get there. And I think we could in the next few years, um, you know, depending on how everything shakes out from this election. Um, but I, I think ultimately courts are gonna push a lot of this. Yeah. One of the questions that came up um, a few times here in the Q&A uh, mm -hmm. is around the definitions of fairness, the parameters around which we uh, uh, establish what fairness means. Um, and Sue Dwyer asked a question I think that resonates with several other questions in, in the Q&A. Uh, what are the parameters of fairness? Is fair, if fairness itself is to be unpacked in terms of patterns, and let's face it, machine learning is all about mere pattern recognition, what existing patterns can we feed to machine learning as, as training data? Um, so I wonder if any of you could speak to uh, what has emerged as an important term in this discussion, which is fairness, um, but similarly has um, a lot of unpacking to do around that term. How do we think about this term when we're approaching algorithmic bias? Mm -hmm. And I'll leave that open for any of you. I mean, I'll just say in my research, just real briefly, that fairness test is elusive, right? There is no right or wrong answer in terms of fairness. The question becomes, and this is particularly for scientists that are listening today, the extent to which the outcome or the prediction that results from the model in some respects may lead to uh, fewer people being um, detained or incarcerated, but it still leads to people being detained and incarcerated who are already in that system. So let me tell you what I mean by that. When you think about the training data that we use to train these models, particularly in criminal justice algorithms, they already start out unfair. And so if they start out flawed and unfair, it means that the model, even with the uh, propensity to change variables to maximize fairness, in some way will still be unfair. Um, and as a sociologist, I've not been able to tell people what I think is a good definition of fairness, except that when you're trying to assess your model and you're thinking about fairness, are you considering a, a checklist of criteria is basically what I tell folks that come to me on this, that say, I am starting with flaws in my training data. So just the last thing. If your facial recognition does not read my face because it does not pick up on darker skin hues or I change my hair, tell me. 
And to me, as a researcher, as a sociologist, that's where you begin to show more evidence of responsibility and you know, you're more ethical and potentially more fair when you're allowing subjects the um, opportunity for the algorithm to be much more explainable to them and to disclose where those deficiencies may actually exist. Great, thank you. Um, and in our last four minutes or so, I wanted to give you each um, a moment to uh, position algorithmic bias uh, within our context. Here we are, November 12th, 2020. Um, COVID cases are on the rise. Uh, we're facing a lot of disinformation. Schools are remote. Uh, distance learning is, is a challenge for students uh, in the context of the digital divide. Um, and so within this moment, um, what should we be looking out for? What are things to consider here on November 12th uh, among our contexts uh, here? In what ways should the participants who are listening to this be on the lookout for algorithmic bias in their everyday lives in, on November 12th, 2020? Uh, and Marjorie, do you mind if I um, uh, pick your brain on that? Sure. Um, November 12th, during a pandemic with COVID cases spiking, one of the, the issues um, which has not come up in, in our discussion that, that is concerning to me is how we deal with age. And certainly in talking about COVID, there have been a lot of interesting things said about people who are at the oldest end of the spectrum because of presumed greater vulnerability and so on. And yet you then have, have situations where older people are isolated, which isn't good for them and so on. Without going down <laughs> that, that rat hole, I think there are a number of issues about age that we need to think about. We can think about them in terms of, of education and education systems, because not only does Maryland and other institutions see um, greater education on the part of adults, including older adults. But if you think about these new systems, longitudinally tracking you, you know, raises all kinds of other issues, collections of data, um, keeping data, you can get more personalized education, but I don't necessarily want it to be held against me, you know, what I did several years ago when I was just a different person uh, in, in many ways. So the concern I have about fairness and how people may be treated extends to the, the age dimension. Mm -hmm. And I think that today's circumstances underscore that. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, time. great, thanks. Uh, Jen, how about you? What, putting algorithmic bias in the context of everything we're facing today, what stands out to you? Uh, so we got 20 seconds left. I, yeah, no, I, I, I think- I don't want to be we, that we, cynic, yeah. <laughs> um, but I'll say, uh, Algorithms are gonna be sending you in all sorts of ways that are probably unfair. And I think the lens at this point to apply to it is who's gonna make money based on the things that you're being shown by whatever political positions you're being pushed towards, whatever COVID positions you're being pushed towards, mm -hmm. who's making money? Cause that drives all of it. That's why all of this is a big deal. Um, that should give you a lens to think about how you're being manipulated because all of this is designed to manipulate us in one way or another and hopefully can then push us as, you know, I don't think that in, the responsibility should all be on us as individuals, but I think given that this is being pushed down upon us, having that as a thought can maybe push us to some alternatives so we kind of circumvent what the algorithms are doing. Great, thank you. Yeah, and Nicole, what about, what are your thoughts? Um, I say here, here to the scientists. So this is one of those areas where it's actually great to be at the party um, because it often doesn't end well when I'm talking to scientists and mathematicians. But I, I agree with everybody. I think the key thing is going forward, we need to improve upon algorithmic literacy so that everyday citizens can understand what's happening. We need to impose some type of responsibility framework that allows us to be less subjective when we're trying to actually audit and manage algorithmic um, outcomes. And we need to ensure that these, again, are lawful so that we're not perpetuating the very discrimination that people have fought hard against. Going back to Marjorie's point, the people who have been highly susceptible to COVID have been people of color. They will also potentially be the algorithms that chase them down, deny them health insurance, and actually exploit their condition based on their diagnosis. So we just need to be much better stewards before these tools are weaponized against us. 
Thank you so much to the panelists. Uh, this has been an amazing discussion. Uh, one, I hope that we all can continue uh, having. I appreciate your thoughts. And thank you to the participants who came and listened uh, to us. I hope you all have a wonderful evening ahead. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>